Hi all and welcome to my channel called Girl Uninterrupted. My name is Saitel and I'm currently a gender, media and culture student at a London University. So gender studies is part of my everyday life. I'm really passionate about it. This episode is the first and introductory episode called Being a Feminist Killjoy. And basically I'm drawing on Sarah Ahmed's term feminist killjoy that she talks about in one of her essays to try to help deconstruct some of the misconceptions about feminism and talk about why it is that feminists and feminism have gotten a really negative stigma. Unfortunately in our society, feminists and feminism are often associated with being super aggressive and super man-hating and that is just not the case at all. Obviously, as feminists, we are going to critique a patriarchal society and by definition, the patriarchy is um, a social system whereby men hold all the power, be it political leadership, um, moral leadership or social privilege. So naturally, we are going to end up critiquing men's position of power and potentially cultural attitudes that men hold which are misogynistic. Now, if you are a man and you have a problem with this, you probably should start to question why when people do have problems with feminism, as I'm going to continue talking about regarding the feminist backlash, it's because they're sat in an ivory tower that is a privileged one, and um, in that ivory tower people are often white, um, they're often male, and they're often middle to upper class. So something to keep in mind whenever you feel that somebody else is being a feminist killjoy. You have to ask, what joy are they killing? In Ahmed's essay, which is what I draw from, she talks about the fact that in our society um, and in multiple societies, we have been gifted with a set of rules and those rules, if we choose to abide by them, are meant to make us happy. And there's a huge emphasis um, in our world on happiness and what can we do that's going to make us happy. Now, it says it on the tin in that feminists are seen as killjoys, we kill that happiness, but it's not quite killing the happiness that we do, it's questioning it. So in this video, I'm going to try and deconstruct some of the misconceptions about feminism. I'm going to try and explain how there are multiple feminisms, and so putting feminism under one man-hating branch is super problematic. And hopefully shed some light on current struggles that feminists, as well as non-feminists, continue to have today. What really inspired me to start these videos was the reaction that I got from certain demographics of people when I told them I was going to study gender studies. Now, the reactions were varied. Often, most often, it was just um, a, an awareness of what the field even entails and what it actually means to be studying gender. Um, other reactions were quite critical and oh, other reactions were just flat out laughter in my face. Um, super, super dismissive. And um, clearly to me, it showed that there is a huge gap in popular knowledge consumption about feminism and gender studies and gendered issues in our society. And so, by popular demand, I'm here doing a feminist vlog. Now, the backlash that I received when um, saying that I'm a feminist in my day-to-day -day life, and backlash that we often see in our modern society, especially online, against feminism, that has been not going on for a really, really long time. It's nothing new. In fact, Susan Flutie writes an amazing book about the backlash to second wave feminism in the US in the 1970s. Um, that is literally called Backlash by Susan Flutie, The Undeclared War Against Women. Now, she talks about the social, political, economic backlash and the backlash in the media that came um, after the women's liberation movement and the bra burners of the 70s, which by the way was actually a media myth that was totally made up. There was no trash can on fire. There was a trash can, they didn't get a fire permit, so no bras were burnt that day. And yet, the name stuck. And that just demonstrates the power of the feminist backlash. You know, a lot of the things that the women's liberation movement were fighting for and a lot of their manifesto wasn't even reported by the media. So all we remember in our history of that event was literally that women burned their bra. A lot of the other amazing things that they were doing got lost. And we see that happening over and over again. We see these cycles repeating themselves 
every day. Those feminists were framed as butch, sexually frustrated, lesbians, um, housewives with nothing else to do, and those are the stereotypes and those are the misconceptions of feminists that stuck. Unfortunately, wherever there are female voices speaking up and speaking out for their rights and against patriarchal oppressions, there is always going to be men who aren't happy about it. A really good example of this happened just the other week. Um, as I said, I do gender studies and because I'm studying full time, the quickest and easiest way for me to do any sort of feminist activism is online through my social media and sometimes it's jokey and sometimes it's serious, um, as it should be. And recently I found out that one of my posts on Instagram ended up on a lads group chat and on this group chat they proceeded to rip into me about my feminist activism. Some of the comments included, she needs to get a fucking life, um, she needs to shut the fuck up about these issues, and the cherry on top, the all too familiar, she needs a good dicking um, at this person, would you do the honours? Now, I'm smiling because it's laughable, but it's also super problematic, and it's an issue that's transcended time spaces and geographical boundaries, and it's something we need to talk about and that we need to question. Why is it that wherever there is a woman speaking up about gender problems, which do exist, um, the facts are there, men feel super threatened and, you know, we could talk about toxic masculinity in another episode and we could talk about the male ego. Um, but it does always come down to this backlash, this resistance to progress. We see it wherever there is anti-racist activism, there is racist backlash. It's always gonna be two steps forward, one step back, um, but it will help if we had more people stepping forward and less people pulling us back. So I think one of the biggest contributors to this backlash is the lack of understanding that there are actually multiple feminisms, and this is something that we are taught every day on my course. Um, you know, feminism looks different in different countries, different feminisms hold different um, priorities and values, and we can't paint feminism with the same brush. The belief that there was first wave feminism with the suffragettes and then second wave feminism with um, the women's liberation movement and then third wave feminism which is sort of you know post feminism is actually a really anglo-centric western centric understanding of things which is super problematic because feminist trajectories happen very differently in different countries so take the suffragettes for example and the suffrage movement which literally means like the right to vote so that's why it's called women's suffrage because it's sort of like the fight for women's right to vote um, in the UK that happened in 1918 and women over 30 got the vote then in 1920 it happened in America in the US it wasn't until 1930 that women in South Africa got the vote and that was only white women so already we're seeing a 10 year time gap between women's suffrage in one western space and women's suffrage in another colonized western space. It wasn't until 1946, that's after World War II, that women's suffrage was adopted in Liberia, Kenya, Palestine, Cameroon, Korea, Vietnam, Yugoslavia, Romania, and Guatemala with restrictions. And it wasn't until 1950 that women in India got the vote. So already that's 30 years between first wave feminism in some countries and first wave feminism in other countries. So really, to talk about waves of feminism in such an essentialist way, in such a universal way, there's a lot to dismiss and eradicate feminist trajectories in countries within the global south um, to a point where they don't exist in our popular knowledge. It's important to emphasize that obviously feminism is a movement. Um, it's a social movement, um, it's an activist movement that is in constant motion and um, even often in conflict with each other. Stuart Hall talks about terrains of struggle in terms of media representation and that media representation is a terrain of struggle for representation or for, you know, the correct kind of representation. Feminism is exactly the same, it is a terrain of struggle, so you have 
different voices fighting for um, space, fighting for media attention. Um, often the feminism you see online is a product of who is chosen to be seen and who is not chosen to be seen. Issues of visibility within feminism are really, really important. And that can be seen with the women's liberation movement in the 1960s and 70s, because what we saw in the terms of the bra burners was a very white middle class brand of feminism and a lot of their priorities and a lot of the things that they were rallying for centered around white women in America's lives. Um, what they didn't consider were black women's lives. Now, the civil rights movement, on the other hand, also did not prioritize black women's rights and lived experiences. And so you have on the one hand, black men's rights being prioritized in the civil rights movement. On the other hand, white women's rights being prioritized in the women's liberation movement. And so black women literally fell through the cracks of representation. Therefore, that's why then you get the concept of intersectionality and that metaphor and that sort of theory of knowledge and why it came about because there was a huge gap in, in feminist knowledge production surrounding black women's rights. So you have amazing theorists like Adrian Rich, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, um, Patricia Hill Collins, the Combahee River Collective who were engaging in their activism at the same time as the women's liberation movement and the OG intersectional feminist, Sojourner Truth, who was an abolitionist um, and a freed slave who rallied and fought for the rights of black women. And her famous speech called Ain't I a Woman is available on YouTube as a re-performance and you can also just read it um, if you type in Ain't I a Woman. It's an amazing read and this was happening in the 1700s. So intersectional feminism trajectory was also taking place for a very long time. So some feminisms are more inclusive than others and so when someone sort of questions my feminism and says to me, oh, well, you're a feminist, that means you hate men, and you protect people who falsely accuse men of rape, and you support um, shutting down halfway houses for men in the US. I say, no, I don't. Maybe a different feminist does, or someone claiming to be a feminist, or a group claiming feminism. But yeah, some feminism is discriminatory, but most isn't. I don't align myself with feminism that excludes um, people on the basis of sex or gender or race um, or class. Um, but it is important to keep in mind that this is a work in progress and I take Jamila Jamil's term of feminist in progress very seriously, which is why I study what I study. Um, it's important that we're constantly educating ourselves and constantly trying to better our feminism and better our understanding of feminism or feminists and the world around us and, and different activist movements. Now, back to being a feminist killjoy. Something that Sarah Ahmed um, illustrates really well in her essay, which is really nuanced and complex and rich, and I do recommend um, reading it. But a summary is that we can be sat around a dinner table and one of us be a feminist. Now, if somebody on that dinner table says something problematic, um, be it racist or sexist or classist or what have you, the person who speaks up and speaks out against that um, form of oppression often bears the burden of the tension that then amounts in the room because of you. But really, if we're looking at the root of the problem and the root of the tension, it's the person who said the problematic thing in the first place. And I think that there is something to say for actually encouraging people to make this world a better place and to start calling out the problematic parts of our society and not being ashamed to do so. That It takes courage and it takes intelligence and it takes an awareness of right and wrong. And I think that if you are a person who has a problem with feminist killjoys or killjoys of any kind, um, who are calling you up on your problematic tendencies, you probably should take a introspective look at yourself first. Luckily, Sara Ahmed presents us with a solution to this and a different way of thinking about it, which I find really helpful. And that's to, instead of call feminist killjoys, understand that actually feminists 
find joy in righting the wrongs of the world, be it on a micro level or a macro level. Often these things work in tandem anyway. So I find joy in calling out oppression and in trying to combat someone else's oppression or my own oppression or doing things that I feel are going to contribute to a world that doesn't oppress my daughter or my daughter's daughter. Um, that's where I find my joy. So really it's killing a problematic joy that can then make space for more progressive and positive forms of happiness and living. So yeah, I encourage everyone to find joy in trying to change our world for the better. I really hope you found this video useful or informative or entertaining. Um, if you did, please do like and subscribe to my channel. Um, I'll be posting videos every week about all your favorite topics like toxic masculinity, Eurocentric beauty standards, my personal favorite, my big hairy problem with the Kardashians. See you soon.